Good morning. It's good to see everybody out. We've got a, got a good crowd today. We've got visitors with us, and we want to welcome you and invite you back to any opportunity you may have to come back. We, we appreciate your attendance today. Uh, if you would, remember to fill out an attendance card and place it in, in either one of the baskets on your way out. And remember the announcement sheets. There's uh, always information there and scriptures that Eddie's going to use in his lesson. So pick one of those up on your way out. On our sick list this morning, Sister Norma Stanford's not doing well. She continues to be in a nursing home over, over at Columbus. Uh, Madison Arnold from Sullivan is having severe health problems, and we need to remember her in our prayers. Are there any others we need to make mention of? Have a card here from, from, from Tammy. She says, our family would like to say a special thank you to the church family for the flowers, food, cards and kind words during our loss. And of course, her father, Mr. A.G. McReynolds, passed away this week. And so I want to remember them, remember Tammy and her family in our prayers as well. Uh, there will be a box in the foyer for candy for the people out at the nursing home uh, for Easter. So if you, if you remember that, and I, I think the bulletin says it's either sweet or unsweet, sugar or sugar free. So. If you have something would like to participate in that, put it, uh, bring it, put it in the box out in the foyer. We had a good week. We had a great week this week. Jennifer Welch was baptized Monday, and we want to congratulate her and, 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 and tell her how proud we are of her. And, and also Rebecca Standridge has asked for our prayers and want to remember her as well. So we had a, had a great week and, and looking forward to another one. Uh, I sing this morning to be directed by Brother John Ross Johnson. Proper time, Joe McNeese will lead us in prayer. O.Z. will be over the Lord's table this morning. Eddie has our lesson. Remember our, our Sunday evening worship service at 5 and, and Wednesday night at 7. Bow with me, please. Father in heaven, we're thankful that, that we're able to be here today. We're thankful for our health. We ask you, Father, to be with those who are not doing well, to undergoing serious health problems. Pray that you be with them, be with those who are attending through them. Continue to watch over us, forgive us when we sin. In Christ's name, amen. Scripture this morning pertaining to the offering we make to our church is coming from 2 Corinthians 9, 10 through 12. Now, many, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything for liability, which causes thanksgiving through us to God, for the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also an abounding through many thanksgivings to God. Let's pray. Kind Father, I want to thank you for another day of life you bless us with. Thank you for our health, be it good as it is. Thank you for our homes and our families. Thank you for everything we have in our lives, God. We know it all comes from you. We want to give back a portion this morning, Father, and help you uh, send help or help is needed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, our first song this morning will be 10,000 Angels. Sing the first verse of this song. <clears throat> they found the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him.
Uh, the scripture this morning is going to come from John 19, 12 through 16. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the preparation day of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, Behold, your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified, so they took Jesus and led him away. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for another beautiful Lord's Day you've given us. Thank you for another day we come to church to worship and to gather around this table and take this memorial feast. We well, thank you for this bread, which is a symbol of our Savior's body that day he went to the cross for our sins. We take it now, we pray it be pleasing and accept on thy side. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. give thanks for the cup. In a like manner of kind Father, we'll thank you for loving us. Thank you for your son, God, the sacrifice he went through for our sins. We'll thank you for this cup with the contents of the fruit, contents of the fruit of the vine, which is a emblem of our Savior's blood he shed that day. Help us to remember this pain and the suffering he went through just for our sins. In Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful morning that you've given us to come out and worship you this morning. We're thankful for this group of people and our opportunity to, to worship you together. Pray that you be with the eldership and the ministers here and continue to bless them and the work that they're doing here in this place. Pray that we'd all be supportive of that and we'd all do our part. Pray that you'd be with the, uh, those this week who've lost loved ones and those who've been restored and uh, been baptized into Christ. Pray that you'd help all of us to know what to do to support them and pray that you'd give them the strength that they need to, to go on and um, become stronger Christians. Pray that you'd Continue to be with each one of us as we're in our workplaces this week, that you'd help us to be good examples for you and that we may can take opportunities to share the gospel with people around us and show, uh, show your love to those that we deal with every day. Thank you for all the ways that you bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Invitation song will be Soldiers of Christ Arise. Sing the first and the last verse of that song. The song before the lesson will be When All of God's Singers Get Home. If you would please stand as we sing the first and third verse. This morning, we're going to look at an incident that took place in the Old Testament between two prophets. And of these two prophets, you will wonder after it's over, why did that one do what he did? But leading up to this incident, we need to know a little bit of what took place. Rehoboam, who is now king of Israel, his father was Solomon. Solomon's dead, now Rehoboam has taken the place of, of his dad. Rehoboam gets some word that the people want to talk, and he's hearing some uh, ideas that they may have. And the idea was, why don't you lessen the burden on the people? You're the new king. You can do that. Just lessen the burden. But he said, well, let me talk about it. Let me think about it. So he goes, and he asks some of the older people of Israel, what about this? Do I need to lessen the burden? And the people said, Yes. The burden that your father put on us was hard, hard to hold up to that. It would be great if you would lessen that burden somewhat on us. Okay, I take it under consideration. Then he goes, he talks to some of the younger men of Israel, and they say, make it more difficult. Put more on them. That's what you need to do. Don't lessen it at all, but make it even greater upon them. And then Rehoboam got to thinking about it, and guess whose side he, he went with? He went with the younger individuals and he began to increase his reign, you might say, upon the people and the, and the difficulties they were having. In 1 Kings 12, 14, it says, And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chast uh, 
ch chastened you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. And some versions say scorpions there, so the scourges. So we went with the young individuals, their thoughts on it, and the people don't like it, and they begin to rebel. The people do, don't like this. And they begin to, I think they kill some of Rehoboam's servants, and Rehoboam gets scared, and, and he, he hides out in Jerusalem. And about that time is when the nation splits into two. You have the two southern tribes, which uh, Rehoboam was king over, which included Jerusalem. And then you have the ten northern tribes of Israel, and here they are with no king. Well, they need somebody to uh, you know, lead them. So a man by the name of Jeroboam becomes king. And Jeroboam is, uh, likes his position. He likes his power. But he begins to realize now if uh, these people, they're in the northern kingdom, if they go south to Jerusalem to worship, they may stay there. And they may all stay there. And if that be the case... What good is a king if you don't have a kingdom? You don't have people. So he decides, I said, what I'll do, I'll set up some alternative places of worship. They won't have to go to Jerusalem, as the Lord said. I'll put up a place in Bethel and a place in Dan, and that way they'll be closer by and they can worship. Well, that went against what God had to say. But yet it even gets even worse as to what Jeroboam does in these particular uh, places of worship and first kings 12 28 here's what he did therefore the king asked advice <clears throat> therefore the king asked advice made two calves of gold and said to the people it is too much for you to go up to jerusalem here are your gods O israel which brought you up out of the land of egypt and he set up one in bethel and another he put in dan now this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. Of all things, not only does he make two different places of worship, but in these places, we're not going to worship God. We're going to worship a calf, a golden calf. And it reminds them it was these calf or the calf that brought you out of Egypt. Well, that's a great lie. We know that. But that's what he did. And he continued to to proclaim idol worship. He would build little high places here and there, put idols here and there. He was just causing a disaster there in the ten tribes of Israel. And God got enough of it. So he sends a young man to go to him and to tell him, if you don't repent of this, you're going to be destroyed. Well, this young prophet, he goes up to, to where Jerobo Jeroboam is, and in order to show Jeroboam that he was from God, God has told Jeroboam, when, when the time is right, you take that altar that they're offering all these sacrifices on, because Jeroboam was in Bethel in the altar part there. And he says, I want you to just strike it, and it's going to, it's going to split in two, and all the ashes are going to go everywhere, and that way Jeroboam will know that you are speaking on my behalf. But Jeroboam goes... He goes to the king, I mean, this prophet goes to the king, Jeroboam, and he tells him, you need to stop this. You need to repent of this. God's had enough of it, dividing the nation like what we're doing here, all these places of worship, and now you've got these golden calves. I want you to stop. Stop it immediately. But Jeroboam, I'm not going to stop it. Instead, what he does, he stretches out his hand, toward this young prophet, the king does. And he says, arrest him. And apparently he had some guards or servants around him. And as soon as he stretches out his hand to, to tell the people to arrest this young prophet, his hand just withers up like an old raisin. And it just flops. He can't even control it. And he's concerned about this, greatly concerned. What has he done? Well, we'll see what happens in 1 Kings 13 and verse 4. So it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel that he stretched out his hand from the altar saying, Arrest him. Then his hand which he stretched out toward him withered so that he could not pull it back to himself. The altar was also was split apart and the ashes poured out from the altar. 
according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. So sure enough, the altar split. Jeroboam knows this is, this is not, not good for me. My hand's gone. But the altar's wide open here. I know it's from God. And he takes it pretty serious now. And he pleads to this younger prophet, please pray to God that my hand will be restored. And this young prophet does. And his hand comes right back. He now has full use of his hand again. And Jeroboam is happy. This is great. And he says to this young man, young prophet, why don't you come home with me? I'd love to give you something to eat and something to drink. I just show my appreciation. Well, the young man, the young prophet says, I can't do it. Because the Lord has commanded me, I, when I come here, I'm not to go eat with anyone. I'm not to drink while I'm here. I'm, I got to go back home a different way in which I came. And that's what he told him. He stood up to the king. I'm not going to do it. Can't do it. I'm going to put the Lord before yourself. Well, okay, Jeroboam says, appreciate it. Go on about your way. Well, he does. The young man, this young prophet, he's going home a different way. And there's an older prophet there in town in Bethel. And this older prophet gets word that what this younger prophet has done. He gets word that he withered the hand of Jeroboam. He gets word that the altar is split in two. He hears about all this, and he wants to meet this young man. So he said, where, where is he going? He was also told about the servants that he couldn't go and eat with the king or drink with the king, and he had to go a different way. He was told that as well. So the old prophet said, which way is he going? And they said, well, going that way. And he runs and he catches up with him. The old prophet does. He finds the young prophet sitting under a tree. He is resting, and, and well, he begins to have a conversation with him. And... He invites him to come back to his house for something to eat and to drink. And here's what the young prophet says to him. Well, what the old, what old prophet says first. He said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, Bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water. And he was lying to him. So when the older prophet says, come to my house, the younger prophet says, I can't do it. I can't eat. I can't drink. I got to go back the way home. And then for some reason, this older prophet here lies. He said, the Lord said to me that it's okay. An angel spoke to me, the Lord sent. It's okay for you to come back to my house and eat and drink. It's okay. And the young prophet believes him. He doesn't know he's lying. He believes him. So they go back to his house in 1 Kings 13 and verse 20. Now it happened as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah saying, Thus says the Lord, Because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord, and have not kept the commandment by which the Lord your God commanded you, but you came back and ate bread and drank water in the place of which the Lord said to you, Eat no bread and drink no water. Your corpse shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Now the Lord does speak through the old prophet. He says to the young prophet, You have disobeyed disobeyed and now you're going to die but you're not going to be buried back home in, the, in your father's tombs he doesn't tell him where he's going to be buried just it's not going to be here where you think it's going to be why did old prophet do this why did he do it well the young man leaves he don't know what to believe do I believe him the first time he said, the Lord said to me? Do I believe him the second time he said, the Lord said to me? He doesn't know. He's confused right here, not knowing what to do, but he leaves. And as he is leaving, he gets out on the road a piece and a, a lion comes out. 
takes him off his donkey. He's riding the donkey, kills him, doesn't eat him, and just leaves the body there, the lion does. The lion is on one side of his body. The donkey is on the other side, still alive. The donkey is. And people begin to see this. And what's going on? And it gets back to the old prophet. And the old prophet says, oh, I know who he is. He's that young man that came to me. I'm going to go out and I'm going to help him. I'm going to take his body and I'm going to bury it. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what he does in 1 Kings 13, 30. Then he laid the corpse of his own, laid the corpse in his own tomb, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. So it was, after he had buried him, that he spoke to his son, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. Well, we look at this story, and there's several things we can get from it. And one thing about it is divine direction. We saw in verse 9 where this young man, he knew that he was not to eat or drink water while he was there. He was not to go home the way he was to go home a different way in which he came. And that's what he was telling uh, Jehoiakim, not Jehoiakim, Jeroboam there, telling these words. But how this young man, why did he do it? He, why did he believe his lie? He understood the, the command completely. He told the king, here's what it says. He even told the old prophet, here's what it says. But he listened to a lie. He had divine direction, yet he didn't follow it. We would do well to learn from this young man because we've been given specific instructions when it comes to our worship, when it comes to our salvation, what must one do to be saved? When it comes to faithful living, the question is, are we going to follow those divine instructions? Or will we listen to somebody who may sound good and they may have some kind of title after their name or before their name or whatever, but if it contradicts the Word of God, we better be careful as to what is being said divine direction we have divine direction today in the bible and we don't have to rely on what this person said or that person said we have it and we can back it up by the scripture so d divine direction is a good thing also this young man there was deception he said i too am a prophet i'm, I'm saying he was yeah he was a prophet but the lord an angel didn't speak to him there is deception that took place and I don't know why he would, he would do this. I don't know why he would do it, but he did so. And yet we have a lot of false teachers today in the world that will do the very same thing. They will tell a lie knowing it's a lie. And there's one thing to say something and, and you're, just, you're just wrong. That can happen. But it's one thing to say something and you know it's wrong and you're doing it to deceive. Paul talks about it to Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2. And now the Spirit expressively says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Verse 2 there, speaking lies and hypocrisy. Here's a person who knows they're wrong and they're out to deceive you. They, don't, they want to do that. They want to see you stumble. They want to see you fall. They want to take you under, I don't know, their control or whatever it may be. Paul is warning Timothy of this. He's warning us of this. And these individuals may even quote scripture, but they may twist it and turn it around. Always beware of those who say, the Lord told me this. That's a red flag. Beware of those who say, an angel told me this. That's a red flag. Beware of somebody who will say, well, the Holy Spirit revealed this to me. Red flag. Because we got the scriptures. That's what tells us. That's where the word of God is revealed and not through somebody. He doesn't operate that way anymore. 
The young man, the young prophet, he needed to listen, but he got deceived by a man who knew what he was doing. He knew the Lord had not spoken to him. Galatians 1 and verse 8, But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what you have preached to you, let him be accursed. And then 2 Corinthians 11, 4, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. If an angel were to tell you something different from the word, don't believe it. Beware, old Satan, he who make himself look good. An angel of light, he'll appear right, appear good. He may quote some scripture. And Satan can quote scripture. He's done it before in the scriptures. But be careful. He's not out. He's out to deceive, deception. Then we find deviation. First Kings 13, 9. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. He shouldn't have done that. He deviated from what God told him to do. Don't go back. Don't drink. Don't eat. Go a different way. Well, he went back. And it's going to cost him. The old prophet. Probably he was confused. The young, he confused that younger man for what he did. And, and when he leaves, that's when the, uh, the lion attacks and gets hold of him. Not good. And then in 1 Kings 13, 21, And he cried out to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord, because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord, which you have not kept, kept the commandment which the Lord God delivered to you. Deviation. After eating and drinking, then the Lord speaks to the old prophet for certain, and he tells the younger prophet, You messed up. You messed up. He deviated from what was true. And then we find the destruction that's brought about on this young man in verse 24. And when he was gone, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his corpse was thrown on the road, and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the corpse. There's the young man. It cost him his life. Believe in a lie. It cost him his life. If anybody should have died, you would think it would have been the old prophet. He's the one that caused it. He should have been held accountable. He's the one that did all this. But yet the young man was still accountable as well for believing a lie, going against the word of God. I don't know what came of the old prophet. Eventually he died. I don't know how God dealt with him. Did he repent of this? But I don't know why he did what he did, but he did. But what he does there in the end, when he... Uh, makes an offer of his own tomb to put this young man in. I'm wondering here what we see in verse 26. I'm wondering, did he do this wanting to look good to the people? Who else knew that he told this young man a lie? As far as we know, it was just the old prophet and the young prophet sitting at a table. He lies, the young man loses his life. Maybe the old prophet is wanting to say, I want to look good to the people. I'll go out and I'll get his body. And I'll let him have my own tomb. And even I'll say some good words like, when I die, put me in there with that good man. I don't know. Could have been guilt. It could have been guilt. He could have had some guilt. and Therefore, I'll go and get the body. I'm responsible. I put him in my tomb. He has nowhere else to go. I want to be there with him. It could have been guilt that caused this. We don't know. But the thing about it, what we can learn from it, we don't need to deviate, be deceived from the Word of God. What God has told us to do, we need to do. Whether it comes to our worship or whether it comes to our plan of salvation He's given to us or whether it comes to just everyday living as a Christian, Listen to what God says and don't listen to those who would go against the word because we don't know what's going to happen to those who lie to us, but we know what's going to happen to us. And we're the ones, we need to be concerned about our soul, what it means to deviate, go away from, from the word of God. If you're not a Christian this morning, God's plan is very simple. 
And what one must do to become a child of God. And think about it. There are many who will deviate from that. They won't tell the truth. The Lord tells us you've got to believe in His Son. John 3 and verse 16. Repent of your sins. There in Luke 13, 3. Is then we are to confess the great name of Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Acts 2, 38. And live a faithful life thereafter. Revelation 2, 10. There we have God's plan. Don't let anybody tell us, even the angel from heaven, tell us anything different. That's what one must do to be saved. If you're not a Christian, or not become that child of God, or as one who just needs prayers to come back home to our Lord, maybe you have been listening to something, trying to carry you away. You need strength to come back home. That need is there tonight, right? this morning. Come as we stand and sing our invitation. Rise and put your arms.